Thank you, Brad. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, also congratulate your amazing work with the journal. It's really uh, come up a few notches since you took uh, helm and, uh, of course, uh, inciting all of this work. All right, Athens Protocol. These are my financial interests, and most of the companies I consult for are involved with this talk. Uh, what is topo-guided PRK and what will be in the U.S. soon is the ability to incorporate these modalities, many placido disc and sine fluke driven uh, imaging of the cornea into a laser and design treatments like this, which is a very bizarre treatment, a part myopic treatment and a part hyperopic treatment. And uh, the, this can result in treating a very irregular cornea, this is a post-LASIK ectasia, into achieving extreme regularity. And I'd like to draw your attention to this treatment plan with a topo-guided platform, and this difference between the pre-op and the post-op, and these almost look identical. And these are documentation of the sensitivity and specificity of topography guided, but also a possible worrisome sign that this can do extreme irregular ablations and needs very careful administration. So the Athens Protocol, uh, and it's been practiced worldwide with different names, uh, uh, in essence, but it is a PTK procedure, I'll explain to you a little bit why, a partial topography guided, I stopped using the term PRK and use the term second PTK because people uh, misunderstand the uh, purpose of the procedure. It's not a refractive procedure, it's a normalization procedure. Mitomycin C in the southern European population that are mostly practiced, and then high fluence, accelerate if you weigh, if you may cross-linking. Again, this is a treatment plan. You can see how irregular this is. And the key thing that most clinicians don't understand is why are you treating a usually myopic keratoconic cornea with a partial hyperopic treatment? And yes, this may result into myopia, but the key element here is to normalize the central cornea. Why do we use PTK as a first step of this procedure? Actually, I since have used PTK as the second step because um, uh, of uh, tracking reasons, because the uh, epithelium of a keratoconic eye is extremely irregular. So if you scrape this off manually or with a brush, then you have a different cornea underneath, different than the one you've imaged. Uh, and basically there's no uh, significant chemistry in the, uh, or learning curve in the procedure. Uh, there's the PTK, there's the PRK, mitomycin C, and then high fluence cross-linking. It's very straightforward. Uh, it takes about um, a total of 15 minutes. If I can move on to the next slide, please. And uh, basically, uh, this is a standard cross-linking in one eye of a patient. This is an Athens Protocol patient showing the demarcation line that we've described on OCT at a uh, significant depth that gives me as a clinician the security that this cornea has been cross-linked enough not to progress into further keratoconus because as you, I myself feel very bizarre thinning a cornea that's already thin with PRK. And I like to see this as an establishment of the biomechanical stability. We have in the past looked at the idea, which is logical, let's cross-link first, and if needed, do a topo-guided normalization later, which is almost 95% the case in the population that I treat because of difficulty wearing RGP lenses in Southern Europe. And we've seen uh, and reported uh, in the JRS in the past that doing them combined is synergistic, gives a higher, uh, a percentage of uh, normalization and uh, mean keratometry decrease. And of course, I mentioned, we reported this, how to evaluate these uh, with uh, uh, OCT. Now, again, the goal here, this is still an irregular cornea post-op, is to improve these indices. And we reported on this, on how improving mainly the IHD, and you can see a dramatic improvement from 0 0.072, which is a very regular cornea, and don't get tricked by your keratoconic patients achieving 20-20 vision when you refract them, because they do that by tilting the head and moving the visual axis through the tip of the cone to a very normal cornea. And for sure, this patient will drive better at night, even if their refraction is off, even if they're minus one, minus two. And again, these are very impressive long-term data. You can see this is almost five years before and after an almost normal cornea, and again, I'd like to draw your attention to the difference and how it is identical, a mirror image of the cone. Another example, again, uh, IHD going, improving almost 350%. One more. 
And in essence, as a refractive procedure, the Athets protocol is a lousy procedure because a lot of these cases do have a refractive error. You cannot compare this with your PRK or LASIK patients. But as a means to improve best corrected visual acuity, we have no patient that is under 2040 in this case series. And for a cornea transplant surgeon, this is very compelling data. Word of caution, these eyes tend to flatten as years go by, so thus underscore the myopic treatment. They do uh, become a challenge sometimes uh, as they have delayed epithelialization. You can see here there's necrotic epithelium. I would intervene here and scrape this off just locally, put a bandage lens off and have it improve a few weeks later. And again, this is uh, subsequently the report at the JRS of our long-term reports. Cornea epithelium, we talked about a little bit earlier, and we've seen uh, even in the eyes that still have keratoconus, improved keratoconus after the Anthes protocol, a significant reduction in variability of the cornea epithelial thickness, uh, and we've reported on that as, as well. You can see how the epithelium starts and how it normalizes afterwards. And uh, last, I will close what we're starting to work with now in trying to reduce the cornea tissue needed to be removed we're trying a customized variable fluence CXL profile. This is not practiced in the US yet. It's C marked in Europe for a year now with the Avidro device to achieve refractive changes with a cross thinking process and reduce the need of cornea tissue removal. Quite complicated to understand, but this is one of our first patients. You can see this cornea almost normal, and this is a very complicated variable fluence topo guided CXL. More fluence, 15 joules here. 12 outside and four further out, pre and post-op results. So in conclusion, we have found throughout these almost 10 years now that uh, we can stabilize and normalize these eyes. And in the future, I think using customized cross-thinking techniques may make this a more tissue-sparing procedure. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, John.